Good morning and welcome to the LCB Smith Show. I am in my favorite place in the world, Glastonbury, and in my favorite shop in the world, which is the Cat and Cauldron, the witchcraft shop in Glastonbury. My guest today is Trevor Jones. Trevor, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you doing? Trevor speaks French, Spanish, some Dutch, and he's got the BA Honours in Humanities. He's also the director of the Cat and Cauldron, a witchcraft shop in Glastonbury. And it's lovely that the Glastonbury uh, Tourist Centre says that this is about a, a place for those of all beliefs or none. Now, you might think, what on earth am I doing here? I have a granddaughter, a six-year-old granddaughter, who told me about a year ago, well, she actually asked me what happened to my broomstick. And I asked, what are, you, what are you talking about? She said, no, I know you have a broomstick. When I was little, I saw it against the ceiling when you came to visit. So I'm in the right place. <laughs> Trevor, how did you get into working with the occult and the esoteric? It's a very good question. Um, I have always been connected to the land. I, I have a, a, a small holding farm, five acres, mm. about eight hectares. Um, that gave me a grounding and um, I've always done little rituals around the, uh, the farm. We have an orchard and um, I, uh, although I'd had no real connection with Glastonbury, we were only about five miles away, no real connection with Glastonbury because hey, there were a lot of uh, hippie shops here at the time, that I'm talking about 30 years ago. Um, I used to do a little ritual in the orchard um, to nothing in particular, but it was a, a, a thanking uh, of the spirits, whereby once I'd collected all the apples that go to cider, um, around about uh, uh, November the 5th, which of course is uh, significant for, for us for other reasons, around about November the 5th, the apples all seem to be clear up. Uh, and uh, on that day, generally I would close the gate, take a glass of cider out, uh, pour half of it over the gate and say thank you for the harvest um, and then drink the other half myself. Now, I didn't really have any structure of what I was doing um, or any idea and I mentioned this to uh, an old boy in the pub and he said, oh, you must be one of them there, pagans. Mm -hmm. um, and I literally had to go home and look it up. Um, I had no idea what a modern pagan was because, you know, historically I know exactly what they are. I know the definition. But in a modern sense, I had no idea what he was talking about. So I went home, had a look at it, uh, then realised that Glastonbury, five miles away, was actually Pagan Central. Uh, mm. Came in, started um, having a, a, a look at it in a little more uh, um, structured way. Uh, and eventually, um, you mentioned my BA, um, I went to Open University and I, in our evening classes, I actually met um, a witch. Uh, who worked uh, in our original witchcraft shop and what happened there was uh, we um, we got closer and closer and she said well the um, the shop is coming up for sale because the owners have to move on and uh, I at the time my IT career was just about uh, exhausted uh, so I decided to invest in the shop uh, and uh, left uh, the, the witch in, in, in place and started making things for it. Uh, to this day, I still make the wands, uh, the, the mm. stars, all the candles and so on. And uh, so it was a kind of a holistic approach. Uh, and then after a few years, I, I, I became well known as, uh, uh, as the witchcraft shop owner. Uh, and gradually by process of osmosis, I mean, all the books you see behind me, yes, I've probably read all of them. Mm. Um, uh, and of course, you, you acquire a, a raft of knowledge, um, yeah. not wisdom, knowledge. Yeah. Uh, yes, I know a lot, but uh, I don't pretend that, uh, that, that I can actually judge on anything. So, so it was a, a process of osmosis. Um, I call myself a, a, a British occultist. Uh, that is, I, I follow the Western mystery tradition, although I, am, um, I did uh, study Buddhism as a teenager. Uh, mm. I walked away from the church at the age of 16. Uh, my parents were church, I, well, I never went into it, and uh, ended up floating for 30 years, suddenly found the, 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 the lady witch, who's no longer a partner, but uh, um, she's moved on to other things, and um, I've ended up with the shop. Um, 
So you, you were referring to pagans. What is the difference between a druid, a pagan, a heathen, a, 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 a witch? Okay, that's that's a, a very, very good question. Now, what's, um, to me, pagan is an umbrella for anything that is not Christian. Now, that would include, by definition, Buddhists and, yeah. uh, and Sufis and so on. Um, pagan is the umbrella term. Uh, druids and witches, um, the difference between druids and witches, uh, to me, um, and I will probably get shot down by people who know, um, <laughs> Druids celebrate, witches interfere. Okay, you can unpack that all day. Basically what it means is Druids um, follow the, the sun uh, mm -hmm. and the stations of the sun and celebrate when the sun is coming back and when it is at its height. Uh, they don't tend not to do, not always, but they tend not to do a lot of magical work. Witches, on the other hand, want to change things. They want to make their own environment, or particularly the environment of their friends, that much better. They want to change the world. Uh, they want to do something positive to cause change. That's pretty much by definition what, what witchcraft is doing. Um, if you are working magic, that's what you're doing. Um, uh, you will have heard the, 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 the word Wicca. Wicca mm. is a religion. It is the religion of witches um but you can practice witchcraft without being wiccan and you can be a wiccan without practicing much witchcraft so it's there are many nuances it's not a simple question to answer but essentially it's that it the pagan the paganism is the umbrella um it's actually one reason why i describe myself as an occultist rather yeah. than a pagan um because i have to be general I, in the shop i have to be all things to all people but because of my polymath um, upbringing. Um, I'm genuinely interested in a wide range of subjects and it probably means I would never be um, fully initiated in any one path mm -hmm. uh, because I'm always interested in another path and, mm -hmm. and you have to uh, close doors uh, to, to, to open the next one and mm -hmm. I'm not prepared to do it that, that way. Indeed, it, it's a process of, of um... It's an iterative growth process. Yes, yeah. yeah. it's uh, it's a very personal, uh, very personal journey, uh, yeah. and uh, I, I particularly honour all paths. Um, and uh, many of the books that you see right behind me here are actually Christian books. Mm -hmm. uh, I see no conflict with that at all. Um, there are many great things to study in in, uh, in, in uh, Christian literature, um, uh, and particularly the Bible, uh, which. Mm -hmm drove people for 2,000 years. Mm. Um, so I see no conflict with having those in a witchcraft shop. In fact, many of our, our practitioners uh, do use sections of the Bible uh, mm. for their own magical purposes. Hey, just like the Jews did 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Indeed. It, so, it's a book and it's about the message in the book. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And, and, uh, and we have had trouble interpreting it for the last 3,000 years. Years. So, with the nature of this shop, you, you attract a particular group of customers. Are they mostly UK-based, as in the Celts that, that are not from, from Western Europe, Ireland, uh, the, the British I, are? I, we are a tourist town, um, yeah. and uh, so we're a pilgrimage town still, and that, yes. and that can be, as uh, again, Christian or, uh, or generally pagan. Um, probably... Two thirds of my customers in the summer uh, would be um, European or, or American, uh, mm. some Australian, some Chinese. Increasingly, oddly enough, mm. um, and um, so we, we we have to cater for that market, yeah. um, and for the serious market um, behind you, there are um, there there are some serious occult books and many other artifacts that, uh, that, that, that pagans um, uh, and witches will recognize um, mm. and we and we try to cater for all of all of those uh, we also have a very very large um, herb section um, and that is that that has a twofold twofold purpose herbs are used uh, in magic uh, they're also used in healing um, mm. uh, and we can supply both of those markets uh, mm. through not only the um, the shop, but also online, increasingly online. Mm -hmm. So we are, we cater for a very, very wide range of people. Mm -hmm. um, and in a town like this, you kind of have to. It is one of the reasons why I've kept my languages up. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I, you mentioned Dutch, Spanish, and French, and uh, you know, I lived in uh, Holland for a couple of years, so actually, my Dutch is pretty good. Um, but uh, I f and I find that that actually uh, causes a smile in mm -hmm. people because mo and most um, foreign visitors don't expect their own yeah. language thrown yeah. back at them. I, you know, I speak Swedish as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've, you refer to the books. Now, I've been here several times and you have got some amazing books by Dion Fortune, Alistair Crowley, Madame Blavatsky, people who have, are long gone. Where do you source these books? Oh, literally all over. Uh, I'm very lucky these days that uh, a lot of people bring books to me. Um, mm. I have a couple of people, I call them ferrets, yeah. um, uh, who, who find books for me uh, and or at least they know when they get a load of books in themselves. These are dealers. Mm -hmm. um, the, the dealers, when they get books in, they, they pick out the Dale Fortune books for me. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's, so that's a ready market for them. And it also means I don't have to do very much work. Yeah. But um, it's quite, so three or four large collections I've had over the years uh, mm -hmm. where people have either passed on or they've downsized and they no longer have room for the books. And mm -hmm. that has, served me to fill the fill the shop and and that helps you to provide them to to the more discerning customers it, as well it, it means i have a much broader range um mm. i in and i don't i don't stick on any one particular subject as i, mm. I mentioned the christian books we yeah. we also have a a, a reasonable selection of uh, self-help and um, and health books mm. um and because my partner uh, liz is a science fiction author. We also have a large number of science fiction books in the shop. So pretty much, you, if you read, you've got no excuse to walk out of here without a book. Oh, indeed, <laughs> indeed. You also sell some really interesting uh, objects. Um, you, I saw on your website you sell alt altar equipment. Yes, yeah. Um, pagans are like pretty much anybody else. Um, to have a, a place to celebrate or to work uh, mm -hmm. spiritually um, we would we would call that an altar um, most pagans have an altar somewhere in their house or in their garden um, and some of them actually set it up quietly in a wood woodland corner somewhere um, mm -hmm. and that will have all sorts of uh, objects which are symbolic of of the work of the moment or indeed the work of the, the season mm -hmm. um, so in the summer you'll have sunflowers in a in a pot um, but in general terms, it, it wouldn't look out of place in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, very, very much the functions are, are more or less the same. You have a goblet, um, you have a sharp object, um, you have mm -hmm. candles, um, and you have incense. Mm -hmm. uh, and you put a cloth uh, over the table to stop the candles, uh, candles ruining the table. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it has both a practical uh, approach. and. It also allows, it gives you a space to focus. It gives you a, a reason when you step up to that, mm. you change spiritually. And that's important for most people who are in the West. We are very, very busy in our lives uh, mm. and we don't necessarily um, think of spirit all the time. Mm. In the East, it's very, very much more spiritual in general terms. Um, and uh, many religions actually do make you pray four or five times a day uh, yeah. islam for example yeah. um with paganism it's well I, I have to get i have to step out of the real world and into the ethereal world mm -hmm. and one method of doing that is the altar and another method of doing that is, is having your own temple if you've got enough space so your own temple or your own circle mm -hmm. um which you then go into uh do a ritual and come out again uh, mm -hmm. and that's what many people choose to do you also sell, now I, I'm not sure of the pronounce, pronunciation, ceremonial blades. Yes. Athames and Berlins. Right. Okay. Um, Athame is a perfectly acceptable uh, pronunciation. Uh, it's a made up word. Um, the, it came from about 1960, Gerald Gardner and uh, Athame, uh, Athame, Athame. Um, really doesn't matter. It's a, it's a sharp blade. Uh, not necessarily for, for cutting anything uh, on the on the physical plane, but it is meant to cut ties or to to, to point um, power uh, at the object of your magical thought. Mm. Uh, so that's one tool. Um, in larger circles, you'll also have a ceremonial sword, 
Um, anybody who is a, a mason or related to a mason will recognize that. Yeah, yeah. In fact, many of the rituals are almost the same as the, the Masonic ones. Because mm. Gerald Gardner, I mentioned, uh, who was the founder of Wicca, um, was actually a mason. So he, um, he picked what made sense to him um, to, to set it up. And that actually also defined the, the, the working kit of the Wiccan. Um, mm. And hey, you mentioned broomsticks as well, yeah. of course. So yeah. uh, now the broomstick was to clear, clear your space. Mm. So it has a magical function, but of course it has a highly practical function as well. It had to clear your kitchen out because you're burning wood, there's ash all over the place. Yeah. Um, so you use a broom to, uh, to sweep. And sweeping out um, negative energies is what you're doing with it uh, on the ethereal plane. Cauldrons. Yeah. Now, we, in, in uh, South Africans, we have a dish that oh, we yes. make in a cauldron. Um, it's you know we put it on the in the backyard, stoke the fire, yeah. and we tend that pot for hours. Yeah, leave, most... leave, leave it for about a week, and then it's edible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the most delicious stew. It's called poiki yeah. <laughs> yeah. But which is I use cauldrons for different reasons. Um, yeah. I, in fact, we use poiki as one right be, right right beside you now, a big one. Yeah. Um, and um, the the cauldron again was a symbol of cooking, yeah. Um, but uh, is also a symbol of change. Um, so you're transforming something. A lot of a lot of cauldron, uh, witches these days will use a large cauldron and put a fire inside it because there's no other practical way of having an actual fire in the house with all the chimneys locked up. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it, it had the function of cooking, um, and also you can use it for scrying, which is um, divination. Yeah. And um, you fill it with a little bit of water, put a bit of oil on the top to give you some kind of, uh, of restriction, and, um, and then look into it to uh, define, divine the past, which is scrying, or the future, which is divination. Mm. Yeah. So it, ha it has multiple uses. The biggest use it has is, hey, look at me, I'm a witch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you also make scrying bowls from wood. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I have, um, I, I'm a turner, uh, mm -hmm. a wood turner. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have my own lathe and I work with that uh, to produce um, scrying mirrors in the fashion of John Dee. You can look that up online. Mm -hmm. um, John Deem uh, had one uh, that was obsidian. It was completely flat, um, uh, and obsidian is black. Mm. Uh, so the tradition has become that scrying mirrors should be black. Um, mm. So what I do is I take a clock face, a, cl a clock glass, um, mm. at various different sizes, paint the back of it black, um, and make two um, turned bowls uh, which fit together and, mm. and can then protect the, uh, the, the thing. The problem with those are, are it takes me a, a day to make one. Yeah. So, um, so they're on the website, but they're not cheap. Mm, of course, yeah. of course. And you also make staffs and wands. Yes, yeah. Um, it's easy for me to make staffs and wands because I, um, I have, a, as I said, about uh, five uh, acres. Um, that makes about a mile of hedgerow. Um, yeah and an awful lot of trees that need to be trimmed. Uh, mm -hmm. So I end up with the trimmings and they become uh, the, the ones and the staffs in the shop. Mm -hmm. uh, also the runes, I make, I make runes, yeah, sets of runes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and our runes are another form of divination, yeah. um, completely modern. Uh, mm -hmm. they, weren't, they probably weren't used some, uh, for divination before about 1940. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, have, we can trace Back the definition of the runes to 1930, 1940, it was Robert Graves. Mm. Um, but I, I find them relatively easy, if fiddly and time consuming to make. Mm. Um, you know, I have all the, all the tools. And, mm. uh, and those I know are being used across the world. Um, mm. I've sold them in probably 25, 30 countries. Wands go everywhere. Uh, mm. my, my wands go everywhere. Uh, mm. I make very simple ones, but they are guaranteed to be from the tree uh, that I say it is. Um, we have a, a means of marking the wand, um, mm. and uh, that's with the uh, Oum, Ogham symbol, mm. and uh, one, that, that symbol is, is, is accurate yeah. uh, because I know the trees.
and mm. uh, most people can't do that because many people wouldn't be able to recognize a, a, a particular tree in the summer yeah. when the leaves are on it let alone in the winter when, when they're bare yeah. <laughs> so i'm lucky and uh, i i have places i can go to forage for trees that are not available on my own land so mm -hmm. yeah you had a, a work, stu work experience student here a few years ago. It, uh, this is a British um, work crea job creation initiative where people, students get work experience. Yeah. I enjoyed reading about her experience of making voodoo dolls for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, she's, <laughs> she was very, very uh, adaptable. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, invariably, the, uh, the girls that we've had have been fine. We had three guys. One was not so good, but the other two were also lovely, mm -hmm. lovely people. And you know what? Within, uh, uh, they have all remained good friends. Mm -hmm. And I regard that as a compliment because, of course, I'm over 60. These guys are 15, 16. Yeah. There's yeah. a huge gap, uh, age gap difference. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the fact that we've remained good friends uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's great for me um, and it does to me means mean that at least some of the knowledge is going to be passed on to the next generation. I can't dictate the form it's going to of be course. passed on in um, okay. but no the, the young lady you spoke about um, stayed with us for a couple of seasons actually uh, mm -hmm. and she was very vibrant um, mm. Very go ahead. Uh, wanted at one time to read law at Oxford, uh, and we reckoned um, she was doing uh, henna tattoos as well. Mm. Um, and she, she's quite a, a good little artist, and we reckoned um, if she ever did go to Oxford, she would probably be the only <laughs> student in the country who came out of it without a student loan because she'd already got it already determined that she could make money so much money out of the henna tattoos uh, yeah. with yeah. her with her friends that. She wouldn't have to actually borrow any money. So. <laughs> Why not? Lovely girl. And you're in Glastonbury where all sorts of pagan holidays or pagan days are, are being celebrated. Yeah. I've been here once with Beltane. It was such yeah. a lovely experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing, um, pagan paganism, as I said, the umbrella. Yeah. Um, Druids and witches these days tend to work closer and closer together. Um, mm probably because we're a dying breed. Um, mm. And there is a, a wheel of eight, very, very similar to the uh, the church agricultural year, yeah. uh, and driven, in fact, by, uh, by agricultural or, uh, or indeed uh, lunar and solar um, uh, festivals. Uh, so Yule, obvious, um, mm. <coughs> excuse me, um, in bulk uh, is the February one. The yeah. festivals are therefore about six weeks apart. So we have eight, uh, eight main festivals, um, mm. about eight weeks apart. Um, in bulk in the uh, early spring, uh, spring equinox, um, mm. then May Day, um, which is Beltane. Mm. Uh, and that, the resurrection of Beltane, if you like, yeah. uh, has been quite spectacular in town. Um, when, we, when we started 10 years ago, we, um, we instigated a maypole. Mm -hmm. uh, maypole had not been danced in Glastonbury for many years. Uh, and we uh, actually offered the use of our field for the day. Um, we had 100 people turn up and, and the same number the following year. And then the third year the town adopted it and is now done not out on my field, but right outside my shop in the mm -hmm. main market square, which yeah. I find lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really do find that the, the adoption of that and the public expression, if you like, of, of um, overt paganism, uh, I think is very healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, and I, I celebrate the fact that, 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 yeah, we did start it to an extent, but I'm so glad that everybody took it on and mm -hmm. did more more than I ever could with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's Beltane. So you then have Midsummer, which is obvious. Um, you, you, the, the sun is at its peak. Uh, you have Lammas, Lunasa. Yeah. Um, which is the early harvest festival. Uh, you then have um, a festival which I will call Equinox. I refuse to call it what most pagans call it because Mabin doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, email me if you want to hear, hear, hear my views on that one. Um, and uh, then uh, Sowing, which is Halloween. Uh, all Hallows, All Saints, um, it means many, many things to many different people. But again, all cultures and all, all religions and all creeds arrive uh, in Glastonbury. 
Uh, Yule is uh, it's probably a little bit quieter for us and, and a little bit more personal. Um, we tend to duck away from a lot of the, the, the overt commerciality of Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the country is really no longer Christian either. So, yeah. so most uh, Christians, most Christmas practicing Christians, actually also want a slightly quieter time. Uh, and we tend to obviously the other th aspect of that is the days are shorter yeah. um, and you you have a little bit more time to sit in front of the fire and reflect indeed it's fascinating how um if you, if you grew up in a particular culture there are these un immense barriers against anything that doesn't exist within your culture like i grew up in a christian culture yeah. but that didn't prevent me from participating in the maypole dance when i was 11 12 it was part it was expected of me in the christian school that i went to uh maypoles in particular I and mean, you you were brought up in south africa so yeah. um you know that the, the the christianity there is a rather different uh, uh probably a slightly more rigid type yes, um and uh, I'm generalizing, but I, I yeah. do have very good friends uh, from the area. Uh, here, um, the Maypole, of course, probably outdates organized Christianity. Um, and it, it is a, a, a fertility uh, ritual. It was adopted by the church here. Yeah. Um, and I went to a Church of England school, but we definitely, as a, as a youngster, and I am talking 50 years ago, 55 years ago, yeah. as a youngster, we did it. Uh, we, we had the Maypole. Um, it then went out of fashion in, in London, where I, where I was brought up. Um, and rather like Morris dancing here, mm -hmm. um, went, it went out of fashion, went very quiet, and really nobody bothered uh, for a long time. And then I think a, 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 alongside the, uh, the interest in paganism, the increased interest, interest in paganism, which really came about as a result of the repeal of the Witchcraft Act. It meant that people started looking around. Yeah, uh, the, the, the Witchcraft Act was actually repealed in 1950. Mm -hmm. um, and um, within a few years, uh, literature started appearing uh, uh, about paganism. And within a few more years, it started becoming sensational and therefore rather sexy. Uh, mm. So people flocked to it. And then you then you had things like uh, Charmed and uh, those those series, which uh, gave an edge to it. Mm. Um, so I think it's matured very well. But the, and the the maypole is is an aspect of that. But no, I don't. Again, I don't see a conflict. It was yeah. it was adopted by uh, by Christians, and um, mm. if if it has the purpose of um, uh, blessing uh, your your planting, um, or indeed blessing the fertility of your animals. Then, actually, where's the conflict? Uh, you you sell your stuff not only in the shop but also on your website, which yeah. is witchcraftshop.co.uk. Yeah, witchcraftshop.co.uk um, was actually there when I bought into the business in mm. two thousand and three. Yeah. Um, it has always um, supplemented. Uh, uh, the, 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 the shop um, and it sells rather different things um, mm. there are a lot of single uh, items in the mm. shop which I don't get time to put on on, on the website um, mm. the core of the website is the herbs um, and I suppose the second largest uh, um, part of the website would be the books mm. um, but uh, we, we sell everything, including the cauldrons and the wands uh, online. Don't ask me to send a, a, a staff to America because they're six foot long and you yeah. won't like you won't like the postage charges. But the, yeah, but we sell we sell a, a lot online. And in the winter, um, we rely on that for, for our uh, for our business. And you also have correspondence courses, non-residential courses on, thank, on the website. Thank you. Yes, we do. Um, we are revamping those at the moment. They are on the website. Um, we do a, a, a basic practical magic, which um, follows what Liz and I define as, as, the, as the Western Mystery Tradition. Um, the basic practical magic actually um, introduces you to astronomy and astrology, uh, mm. two different things, um, to wood law, to herb law, uh, to um, what, why you are doing what you're doing when you're casting a circle uh, mm -hmm. and working your magic, and uh, it also follows. It also has a little bit of uh, history about where 
all of these ideas came from. Uh, it takes a year. It's a correspondence course, a monthly, uh, a monthly paper. Uh, and there is an advanced course for those who want to go on and practice um, Western meditation. Um, mm. Again, rather different from Eastern meditation, because uh, you and I don't get the opportunity to sit in a cave mouth and be fed a bowl of rice for three months. Yeah. Um, so we have to do our meditation in a different way. Indeed. And, uh, and it also uh, it details many other things. We do a herbal mm. course. Um, we do a tarot course. Uh, Liz has been reading tarot for 30 years, me for 15, um, and, uh, and a couple of other, uh, a couple of other courses. We, we, we also do day courses in town um, regarding some of the goddesses, uh, which some pagans, uh, uh, some pagans like to connect with, um, our name Hecate and, uh, uh, and the Morrigan are two ancient goddesses, Hecate is obviously Greek, Mor the Morrigan is Celtic. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, they are regarded as um, goddesses of the underworld, if you like, mm -hmm. so um, you, you go to them in times of challenge, uh, or in times of sadness indeed. But, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not all celebration, it's, a, it's, <laughs> about, it's about actually actual work, yeah. uh, but the whole idea of it is to, to improve your own mind. Indeed. Um, and, uh, that's the way we work. So the courses we think help people do that. And um, we find um, probably about half the people who do the basic go on to do the advanced. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some people are more interested in the herbal side of it and we, we put them on, on that as well. So mm -hmm. it's all, it's all uh, we found, we, we kept getting asked, um, mm -hmm. you know, because the door is open, Mm -hmm. uh, we are a portal. The shop is a portal to into this world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you you said before we we came on air um, that uh, not all your listeners are, are your your viewers are actually going to know what paganism is. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the times we get people come in. I've had this experience. It's weird. Can you explain it to me? Or um, I've had this experience, I've had it explained to me, and I need this, this, and this. And they know that this is a, a relatively safe space to start. Yeah. Um, whereas the more serious practitioners come around the back here and, uh, and, and find the good books. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't, give, I wouldn't give those to a beginner anyway. It wouldn't be fair. Uh, it wouldn't be fair on the book. I'm not worried about the beginner. They, they, they can do their own thing, but yeah. the book needs to be used properly. Indeed, and it's about developing, about growing into the yeah. knowledge. Yeah. yeah, and it can take it can take many many years to do that. Uh, it's the the main thing is it's it, it's not it's not a lifestyle, you know, it's a life commitment. Yeah, and um, that you have to be aware of. And the other thing that I will say about witchcraft and, and druidry in particular, you can't switch it off. Yeah. Once you have actually experienced that, it's always with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Like you never forget to ride a bike, how to ride a bicycle. Exactly. Um, you never ever get the chance to switch it off. You can you can slow it down, mm -hmm. uh, but it will always come back and uh, and uh, and ask more of you. Mm -hmm. And that's your commitment to um, having access to that power. Trevor, this has been fascinating. I really enjoyed this, and you've answered quite a few questions that I had in my own mind as well. <laughs> Thank you for that. Excellent. No, I've had fun. Thank you very much. And. Uh, Good luck to uh, all your listeners. I hope I hope it's of use. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's really what we're here for. Absolutely. I'm sure people are going to watch it and want to explore and, and learn more. Excellent. Well, they are very welcome to contact me. Um, I'm actually at inquiries at witchcraftshop.co.uk, yeah. um, and you'll probably find me on Facebook as well. If you're if you're friends with us, but you will you will find me on. Facebook. Indeed. And Trevor doesn't have a phone, so don't look for a phone <laughs> number. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have a phone because I'm actually quite deaf, so uh, oh. <laughs> um, and, and also the shop is generally busy, so, yeah. uh, so yeah. I choose. I have to I don't have a phone. I don't have a mobile phone either, yeah. um, because I refuse to be sitting there with the um, with the thumb. My thumbs are arthritic enough as it is from <laughs> from so many years with the pyrography yeah. pen. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, I think I'd better let you go. Indeed. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. And we'll see you again next week, Sunday, same time, same place, four o'clock UK time. Thank you and goodbye.